The National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University, through the Voting Rights Research Repository Project, is sponsoring a three panel series entitled Civic Engagement in the COVID Era and Beyond. During these discussions, our guests will express a number of opinions that do not necessarily reflect those of the National Center or Alabama State University. However, we are happy to invite a vigorous dialogue of diverse opinions among our panelists and hope that these conversations inspire our audience to engage critical civic issues facing our state and our nation. Hello, I am Dr. Howard Robinson, Alabama State University archivist and historian. In today's forum, Civic Engagement in the COVID Era and Beyond, Racism and Home Rule, the Alabama Constitution past and present, we will address the Alabama Constitution, the language in Alabama's governing constitution, having been written in 1901 to project white supremacy, has been considered outmoded for many decades. At the, at the turn of the last century, in order to counter the influence that might be exerted on county governments by black majorities, and to make it difficult to raise taxes, the 1901 constitution gave Alabama legislatures power to administer most counties directly. These anti-home rule policies were first written into the Alabama Constitution in 1875 and then carried through to the 1901 Alabama Constitution. Today, Alabama's Constitution denies local officials the authority to deal with local issues. Instead, requiring decisions at the municipal or county level be addressed by the state legislature or subject to a statewide vote. Consequently, the state's constitution with its 345,000 words is the longest constitution in the world, mostly because of its, of its more than 940 amendments. So beginning in 1915, there have been several attempts to rewrite the state constitution, including a 1983 proposal to submit an entirely new constitution in the form of a constitutional amendment. This proposal passed both, ha both houses, but was struck down by the Alabama Supreme Court just a week before a scheduled statewide referendum. Today's conversation lasts about an hour and will address several aspects of the 1901 Alabama Constitution. First, to provide more context for our discussion, Dr. Burgess English, a professor of history at Alabama State University, will explore the issues around the writing of the 1901 Constitution. Then we will engage our panelists in a discussion on the Constitution's impact in a number of different areas, including the Constitution's influence on areas that have been litigated by civil rights attorney Jim Blackshear. Then Kirk Hatcher, Alabama House of Representatives member, District 78, will look at how the 1901 Constitution influences the legislative process. Finally, we will hear from Nancy hear from Nancy Eckberg of the Alabama Citizens for a Constitutional Reform as she discusses Amendment 4 that Alabamians will decide on in this November's 2020 state ballot. Good afternoon, panelists. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's first start with Burtis English in what he has entitled an indefensible, an indefensible shame, ethnicity, class, and the making of the 1901 Alabama Constitution. Dr. English. <clears throat> Howard, thank you. And of course, thank, I thank rather the center and the university for what doubtless will be a grand occasion this afternoon. I'm quite confident that the panelists will cover ground that I certainly uh, shall not touch. But let me clarify that my presentation is geared not toward the writing of the Constitution per se, but some of the historical and the social and political context and cultural context even in which that document came um, into being. And I think how that you are indeed correct about um, 1875, though one I likewise believe can make a, a solid case that the roots of Alabama's 1901 Constitution bore deeply into the state's constitutional soils of 1868. During that year, a large number of adult male citizens, as opposed to a small and a, a select group of elite white male officials, 
ratified a state constitution that, among other things, um, based legislative representation on all inhabitants and not solely on white people. The 1868 constitution likewise permitted men of all ethnicities to hold public office. It ensured certain independent property rights and liability protections uh, for married women, and it prohibited married men from selling homesteads without spousal consent. The same constitution also made judicial offices elected, abolished imprisonment as a penalty for debt, created the first genuine public school system in Alabama, and authorized the state educational board to oversee the system. Not unlike several issues that continue to beset Alabama, ethnicity and federal intervention or interference, so-called, were primary reasons many citizens opposed the 1868 Constitution. During the previous year in 1867, 18 non-white delegates to a statewide constitutional convention helped draft the proposal that duly registered voters accepted in 1868. Congress's altering ratification criteria enabled passage in Alabama, as well as in the uh, nine other former Confederate states where Congress mandated constitutional reform. Numerous white Alabamans who opposed such reform derided the 1868 Constitution as an illegitimate, a federally imposed, a menagerie, mongrel, or monkey document, among other extremely unflattering names. Other opponents of the Constitution expressed their uh, dissatisfaction in cruel manners, for example, by verbally harassing or by physically assaulting supporters of the Constitution. In the Black Belt, whose African-American voters were key to ratification in 1868, one resident proclaimed, the devil seems to be loose and only God knows what's next. As it turned out, a minor ethnic collaboration, but much chaos among Alabamians followed, especially after November 1872. During that month, voters elected a Republican as their governor for the first time because African-Americans composed nine-tenths of the Republican Party in some counties, according to one Montgomery newspaper. Spokesman for the Alabama Democratic and Conservative Party said their political opponents were members of a, well, let's say uh, the term that they used <laughs> rhymes with bigger, but it starts with an N. They, in contrast, belong to the white man's party. Determined to regain control of statewide uh, governance in November 1874, Democrats conducted one of the most violent and one of the most fraudulent campaigns in state history to this date. All the same, they were triumphant. Soon thereafter, reconstituting Alabama became a main priority. Removing as many ethnic and class equality components of the 1868 Constitution as they could was a principal desire of ruling Democrats once they redeemed or restored predominantly conservative white rule on the state level. Unfortunately for them, federal law prevented a complete return to pre-1868 constitutionalism. Among other acts, Congress ratified the 14th Amendment in 1868 to bolster the 13th Amendment, which ended legal racial slavery in 1865. In 1870, um, Congress ratified the 15th Amendment guaranteeing universal male suffrage for nearly all law-abiding male citizens. A half decade later in 1875, Congress ratified a civil rights bill that sought to prohibit discrimination on the ground of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, though unstated directly in that particular document, of course, former uh, enslaved people were the principal, um, uh, principal actors. Reconstruction legislation prevented so-called redeemers from fulfilling their desire to make all black and by ethnic Alabamian second-class citizens in 1875. Establishing what would amount to black codes undoubtedly would cause the federal government to send additional troops to Alabama and hinder the furtherance of home rule, something about which Howard spoke of previously, and I'm certain that my fellow panelists will address um, following my brief presentation. In general, Redeemers did not have to worry about such matters in 1901, however, that is federal interference or intervention. For almost 20 years earlier, in 1883, the United States Supreme Court fed Jim and indeed Jane Crow by invalidating the 1875 Civil Rights Law. 
1896, the court upheld ethnic segregation on any public conveyance in the country, as long as it provided white non-white passengers, passengers with equal accommodations. Three years later, in 1899, the court ruled public segregation in education was legal, even if a facility did not provide white and non-white students with equal accommodations. In effect, the matter, the court said, was a state affair because it involved state taxation. Yet another item, definitely, my fellow panelists will discuss. So the affluent white industrialists and planters or big mules in Alabama who desired constitutional change in 1901 became ecstatic once they learned about the Supreme Court rulings of the late 1890s. And they, of course, had known about them before then, but they placed additional emphasis on such rulings in 1901. Many big rules were socially, politically, and culturally conservative, if not outright racist Democrats, and they wanted to disenfranchise most Black and interracial men. That big mules also wanted to disenfranchise white men who supported the Republican Party, as well as the Populist or People's Party, and other third party political organizations is a less familiar fact. Big Mules likewise had no issue with disenfranchising many poor white citizens to consolidate their power. The 1901 Constitution, complete with legalized educational segregation, continued mixed marriage and female suffrage bans, initiative and referendum prohibitions, literacy tests, poll taxes, and numerous other embodiments of Jim and Jane Crow was the result. Curiously, many articles disavowed home rule as a governing principle, even though big mules relied on home rule in part to justify the articles. Numerous outdated, ethnically biased or financially and economically destructive aspects of Alabama's mammoth constitution are found in its amendments, including one amendment that grants municipal officials in a particular county the ability to permit individuals to drive golf courts on thera golf course golf uh, carts on public thoroughfares. In fewer than two weeks, voters will get an opportunity to decide whether the state legislature will be able to uh, recompile the Constitution in 2020. While not every ridiculous or archaic component of the 1901 Constitution is eligible for removal, the piece of legislation whose fate voters will decide November the 3rd will eliminate racist language, delete duplicative provisions or provisions that past officials have repealed, merge provisions regarding economic development, and arrange local amendments by their counties of application. Similar attempts to rid Alabama's constitution of at least one retrogressive element, its racist language, failed in 2004 as well as in 2012. Time soon will tell if voters will replicate or help remedy the state's indefensible shame, its 1901 constitution. Thank you, Dr. English, um, for providing us that context for today's discussion. Now we're going to transition to our panel. Um, let us begin with Attorney Blackshear. Um, Attorney Blackshear, could you talk to us about the various ways that the 1901 Constitution has influenced um, the cases that you've argued, um, Attorney Blackshear? Yes, Kirk Hatcher up, I think Attorney Blackshear is going to talk. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sure. So, yes, uh, the Alabama Constitution has been involved in most of the civil rights, voting rights cases that I've been involved in uh, since 1971. Uh, but I've picked out uh, five here that uh, I will refer to specifically. And uh, I'll begin by pointing out that the aspects the racially discriminatory aspects of the Alabama Constitution that these cases I'm about to discuss dealt with involve provisions that will not be affected by Amendment 4. Um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. 
The first case I'll call it, uh, to your attention is none other than Knight versus Alabama. Alabama State, of course, is very much aware of the history of the higher education, the segregation case in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, the Alabama Constitution was a threshold issue in desegregating higher education in Alabama because, let me pull up my own copy here of, of uh, section 256, which is the subject of amendment four. And so section uh, 256 said separate schools and still says separate schools shall be provided for white and colored children and no child of either race shall be permitted to attend a school of the other race. The state of Alabama and all of the majority white universities who were, and they were all defendants in the case, as was the governor and the state board of education, their lawyers took the position uh, that that language in section 256 applied only to K-12 schools that there had never been anything in the Alabama Constitution uh, that required racial segregation in higher education in Alabama. Um, and I'm seeing to be frozen here on the screen. Should I do yes. something? Um, Let me stop the cam and restart it, okay? Well, well, no, well why don't we do this? Um, yeah, I'm gonna let you, do, we're gonna let you restart your, your camera. We're gonna move to, in the meantime, we'll move to you, um, Representative Kirk Hatcher, Representative Kirk Hatcher, um, Alabama House District 78, and candidate for the Alabama State Senate. We said, we'd like you to, to, to look a little bit or talk a little bit about how the 1901 Constitution has impacted the legislative process as you have been involved in. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, and to the members of the panel. And also, uh, uh, I certainly want to mention uh, Attorney Blackshear, who I remember uh, uh, his work uh, from many years ago when I was a paralegal for Attorney Solomon C. Uh, and uh, back in those days, <clears throat> hearing about all his work, not only from Saul, but uh, from Dr. Reed as well, um, to see him still out on the battlefield doing uh, this hard work is, 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 is indeed inspiring. And it certainly is an example of what it is we still have to do uh, in, this, in this state. Now, uh, talk about convoluted. <laughs> uh, you know, my God, Dr. English, when, you know, when sharing uh, the information about this uh, horrendous constitution, uh, uh, it just it's a, it's a fresh reminder of the work that we have to do and continue to do in our legislative body. Look, at the end of the day, Dr. Robinson, when you mentioned those amendments, I think which accounts for probably about 940 plus amendments that have been made to the Constitution, about 70% of those, probably north of 70%, are coming from local governments that are seeking permission to do something that's usually fairly mundane. Uh, uh, things associated with raises for county officials or, or, or when a county office might be open, what time of the day uh, those offices might be open. And what's worse is that what it does, it slows down the legislative process, obviously for larger issues uh, affecting the state as a whole. And that is to say, you know, when local governments have a matter that they need uh, addressed. Um, sometimes in, in my short tenure in the legislative body, it can take up to nine months, literally nine months, uh, to get those things uh, taken up in the legislative body. Uh, to say that uh, the absence of home rule uh, is an issue is, is, is a profound understatement. Uh, we saw, for example, and then I, I'm sure you're going to shift back to Attorney Blackshear, uh, we saw in the 
at the beginning of this last legislative session uh, where there was conversation taken up about uh, the occupational tax. Um, and, uh, and of course, obviously, interestingly enough, it was the first item on our legislative calendar. Uh, that's not by accident. And the idea of what, uh, that a city government, that a local municipality uh, that would know what the needs financial and otherwise might be for their community would have to go before the legislative body uh, for that level of approval is in and of itself uh, repugnant. There I say even suspect, considering the fact that there are other mun municipalities in and around the area that have not had to go, uh, go through that same process. Uh, so there's a level of hypocrisy attached to it as well. So the, 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 the idea, and uh, I wanna add, and, 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 and Dr. English and Dr. Robinson, you can correct me if I'm wrong, please do. I believe uh, our state's constitution, which I think you said is some, you know, somewhere 345,000 words or more, is the longest document in human history, probably longer than the parliament of India. So it is. So, so I think you know this is, you know, we we know, uh, and I was I sit on the committee, uh, as I think I may have mentioned to you, the committee of constitution uh, campaign and elections, and I do recall, I believe my colleague, Representative uh, uh, Marika Coleman, bringing that legislation, and the hope I would add finally, behind uh, 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 the statewide amendment four, is that at least it will be a precursor to the larger piece, which is the goal is to have a constitutional convention uh, to do something about uh, this state constitution. And I wanna add, I think it was Bob Riley, Governor Riley, who might've started in 2003 maybe uh, to do something regarding home rule or the lack of home rule uh, and that failed. Um, and I, the last piece I would offer, which is kind of piggybacking a little bit off of what you mentioned, Dr. English, is that and, and what uh, uh, Attorney Blackshear just alluded to with regards to uh, segregated schools, that uh, I wonder what would happen if we decided to abide by the state constitution when it comes down to football in Alabama. <laughs> Explain what you mean by that. I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We, we want to but, 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 but. But but how now? <laughs> let us not uh, let us not be remiss here. It's not just Alabama. Uh, but let's talk about Auburn and Jackson right. State and that's other right. institutions now. Thank you for the save, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to want to shift back. I think um, Attorney Blackshear has his uh, technical issues worked out. We want to shift back and, and and let Attorney Blackshear continue. You were developing um, three cases. I mean, five cases and. You were looking at uh, the Knight versus Alabama case and and how the constitution, state constitution has it has influenced the, the 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 facts and the issues argued in that case. Could you continue? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Yes, now? I can hear you fine. I had, I had to sign off and sign back in. Yes. I'm back. Well, to get back to Knight versus Alabama, because the position that the state of Alabama took that Section 256. Uh, and the uh, segregation provision in it did not apply to higher education, they threw us in the briar patch. Mm -hmm. So we, we had six trial days of testimony by historians. Uh, three days from Mills Thornton, who was at that time still at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and three days from James Anderson, uh, native of Greene County, who graduated from Stillman College and was a history professor at University of Illinois. He's written a book called The Education of Blacks in the South. Six days of testimony. After that testimony, there was not much doubt uh, of what, how segregation was part of the public policy of the state of Alabama. And it made the rest of the case easy, easier to identify the legacies of those policies that still exist today. The next case, uh, I would point to, oh, by the way, I should point out that one of the side issues in the case was the fact that only the University of Alabama had constitutional status. Only the University of Alabama's board was in the state constitution. Uh, finally, uh, Auburn's got 
uh, added, but the uh, teacher colleges and the HBCUs never had their, did not get their own boards of, of uh, trustees until 1975 and by statute rather than by constitutional change. Second case, Lynch versus Alabama. That was the big case before Judge Smith and Huntsville challenging the restrictions in the Alabama Constitution on the ability of local governments to raise property taxes. And as, as, Professor, as Professor English pointed out, the fear, and, and Dr. Robinson as well, the fear driving these state constitutions, 1875, 1901, was the fear of these black majorities in the black belt. And what would they do if they gain control of public offices, in particular, the tax assessor's office and the tax collector's office, while they would tax white property uh, for the benefit of black school children and other services for the black community, as well as whites. But the, the design of all of these constitutions of Alabama has been primarily to shield white property from being taxed to provide services to black school children and to other black members of the black community. Um, and, uh, and we we ended up losing that case. But if anybody want, and I'm sure perhaps Professor English and others have taken the time to look at at Judge uh, at Judge Smith's opinion, he wrote a long treatise on the history of Alabama. And at the end of it said, I'm sorry, but you're not entitled to any relief. Uh, and we appealed that all the way to the 11th Circuit in the US Supreme Court to no avail. So we lost uh, the challenge to the property tax restrictions in the Alabama constitution. And they were aggravated by amendments that George Wallace got through the legislature in 1972 and 1978 that we know today as the Lid Bill Amendments, and which uh, basically had the effect of taking the tax base out of the Black Belt counties by making uh, agricultural farm and forest property uh, virtually worthless when it comes to uh, applying a millage rate. So the property tax burden in Alabama is borne primarily by private residences and by commercial uh, businesses, not by farm and timberland, which constitutes 80% of the, of the geography of Alabama. Okay, third case, Alabama Legislative Black Caucus versus Alabama. Um, that was the most recent case challenging the redistricting of the Alabama legislature that went to the Alabama Supreme Court. But the, the, the state constitutional issue there was one that we, we couldn't get heard in federal court. That is the, the provisions in the 191 Constitution require that districts be composed of whole counties in both the Alabama House of Representatives and the Alabama Senate. And no county in Alabama was split uh, between two Senate or two House districts any time from 1819 when Alabama became a state until 1974 when the first single member district elections were held pursuant to federal court order. Uh, but the federal court told us in the last go round in the decade following the 2010 census that only the state Supreme Court could decide whether to enforce the Alabama constitutional requirement of whole counties in the legislature. And so, we're faced with the prospect of going to state court to try to get that enforced after the 2020 uh, uh, census. Fourth case, Thompson versus Alabama is a case that's pending right now before, before a uh, federal judge in Montgomery. It's maintained, let me see if I can stop this. Yeah. Primarily by the Campaign Legal Center, I'm local counsel with uh, Mitch McGuire and others. We are challenging the, the laws that disfranchise persons who are formally convicted of felons, of felonies involving moral turpitude. Okay, as, as Professor English was pointing out, the 1901 Constitution 
did not contain the right to vote. It contained all these provisions that restricted the right to vote and was aimed for spe specifically at African Americans and at poor whites. There was a 1996 constitutional amendment. One of the two articles that have been, been gotten through the, uh, the uh, amendment process of the legislative of the judicial article in 1973 and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the suffrage article in 1996. And it was a good amendment Section 177 of the Constitution of Alabama now says that every citizen of the United States residing in the state of Alabama has the right to vote. That is a right that is not in anywhere in the United States Constitution. But we do have it in the Constitution of Alabama as do most state constitutions. So that was a big step forward. The problem was Section 177B left the crimes provision, you know, the 191 Constitution set out a whole long list of crimes that would disqualify one from the franchise, and they were aimed at blacks and poor whites. And the 1996 amendment retains the phrase moral turpitude. They struck all the long list and said now only felonies involving moral turpitude disqualify one. Well, that means that persons who were convicted of abuse of their public authority, such as recent people, we won't name names, but we've got a long list of public authorities who have been convicted of abuse of, a, of their office, they are not disqualified. But persons convicted of, 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 of theft, of uh, sex crimes, of, we well, can go down the long list of things. Moral turpitude, as the courts have said, implies what? It implies something that is demeaning and degrading. And it's a, it, was, it was a phrase that was aimed primarily at the classes of persons that white Alabamians, the big mules, thought they wanted to disfranchise, and we still have that in our Constitution. And as a result, we still have the vestiges of the 191 Constitution in the suffrage article. Now, I think, I think, I think that um, um, Representative Abbey and others pushed through legislation to reduce the number of um, crimes that fall under the moral turpitude um, um, criteria or statute just recently in, in, in maybe in the last three or four years. Correct. In, 20, in 2017. In 2017, mm -hmm. the Moral Turpitude Act was passed by the legislature, but from 1996 to 2017, there was no definition mm -hmm. of what crimes constituted moral turpitude. Correct. And according to Section 177, only the state legislature had the authority to determine which crimes, which felonies did involve moral turpitude. And of course, one of the arguments we're making is all the people who were disfranchised before uh, the passage of the 2017 Moral Turpitude Act were illegally disqualified. But that's, I don't wanna get into the weeds of, the, of our lawsuit other than to say, you're correct. The, the 2017 Moral Turpitude Act finally Defined what those crimes are, but you can go down the list. Members of the legislature, John Merrill, the Secretary of State, put together a committee. They proposed language uh, for uh, what would be crimes of involving moral turpitude, but they also emphasized that it was going to have to pass the legislature. And in the end, the legislature did what you would expect when they were trying to decide which crimes involve moral turpitude. And they left out most of the white collar and abuse of public office crimes and just have the poor folks crimes in there. So that's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. The last case I wanna mention before I turn over, yield my time to the floor, uh, is a case called Alabama State Conference of NAACP versus Alabama. That was a case we just lost a couple of years ago for Judge Watkins in federal court in Montgomery. 
challenging the provisions in the Alabama Constitution that require that the state's highest court, the uh, Alabama Supreme Court, be elected by the voters at large, that is, not by districts. And as a result, uh, today, no African American has even a prayer of getting elected to the Alabama Supreme Court. There was a time, as you may recall, when Oscar Adams and, uh, and uh, oh my goodness, uh, John, John England and my friend, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm killing me. I, I'm sorry, I had my 80th birthday just the other day. And, <laughs> Uh, I'm Happy gonna birthday. I'm gonna beg off. Happy birthday! Yeah, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's Ralph Ralph, uh, look, Ralph, uh, Ralph Cook. Cook. Thank you, uh -huh. thank you very much, my friend Ralph Cook, Judge Cook. Uh -huh. uh, they were able to get on the court because Democratic governors appointed them at a time when Democratic governors needed the black vote. Mm -hmm. That time passed when the Republican Party of Alabama assumed the mantle that previously had been held by the Democratic Party to become the party of white folks in Alabama. The Republican Party has drawn the, the grace line the way, uh, the, the way the Democratic Party did in 1874. And in fact, I, I keep reminding people when I when I first voted in Alabama in 1962, um, right at the top of the ballot, you know, where you pull the the rooster tail lever, the vote of straight ticket voting, was the rooster was the, the logo of the Democratic Party that said white what? white supremacy for the for the right. That's right. And white supremacy was not removed from the Alabama ballot. This is a general election ballot until 1965. Wow. When, when Albert Brewer and some other, Demo, uh, some other state Democrats said, look, we, we, we've just had a Voting Rights Act passed and so forth, and we're gonna have to change this. So the Democratic State Committee, Executive Committee removed white supremacy from the logo of the Democratic Party and said, instead of white supremacy, we will we will complain about federal court interference. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. And so the Democratic Party became the party of civil rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, under the Southern strategy, the Republican Party, it became the party of whites. And so today, as Representative Hatcher knows, we have only two white Democrats in the Alabama legislature, one in the one in the House, one in the Senate, and they're both elected from majority black right, districts. Right, right. So we're back we're back to a one party state when it comes to the state legislature. Um, the Republican Party has a a a filibuster proof majority in both houses. Right. That's five cases I could go into detail, and, and <laughs> but. but Look, I, I'm only pointing out that the provisions that we are challenging in those cases that they, that are still on the books, for example, in the Thompson case, the felon disfranchisement case, those 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 provisions are not going to be affected by Amendment Four. And and the only thing that concerns me about Amendment Four is that it's not hyped in a way that makes it sound like at last we have we have removed the stain of racial discrimination from the 1901 Constitution. That would be a big fib, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. for the reasons that you have just been mentioning. Home rule is, and the lack of home rule is is only the, the biggest of the problems that still remain. Uh -huh. Thank you. If Thank I, you. If I may, if I may Howard, Howard, before we move on. forward, um, may I just make one statement about? I think that just further clarifies some of the um, hypocrisy that Representative Hatcher spoke to, and that Attorney Blackshear uh, discussed there. Well, number one is the most obvious, of course, Alabamians and. Uh, state officials, of course, have no problem with getting federal entitlements and other call it pork, if you will. Uh, and we can talk about the military and so many other areas, but then have a real issue when the federal government wishes to try to, you know, correct and or right some wrongs that have been on the books for forever. But with regard to more turpitude, what I think Attorney Blackshear and others, what really struck me as odd about that particular act from 1901 until those two 
citizens filed, um, you know, suit, federal suit in uh, 1985 was that not only did the Alabama law essentially not have definition, but it did not require registrars with any legal training to decide who could and who could not vote. That's right. So any individual who was <laughs> chosen to be a registrar right. could essentially determine uh, the suffrage of hundreds of thousands of individuals. I think in 2016, a year that was extremely interesting constitutionally and politically and elected for reasons that we shall not discuss, at least I will not discuss, be that as it may, you know, $250,000 by, I mean, 250,000 citizens by one count were unable to vote because of that That's correct. indistinctly worded law, mm -hmm. right? And we're not talking just about these major offenses, yet another relic of that 1901 constitution and 1875 and 1868 and 1865 and the others mm -hmm. is that you know, minor infractions could remove from you yes. the ability to take part in the body politics. So think about this now. For a minor offense, I can't vote on the individuals who then would determine right. my major role in society, which is, which is voting. That's right. That's right. I wanted to raise Dr. Robertson a point of clarity uh, for yes. Attorney Blackshear. Um, you know, I it, and I think I heard you correctly, and 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 I'm and I wish I'd known. Uh, in fact, I think I'm, I know it now at, at just the right time. I've authored uh, the bill that's on our local ballot uh, regarding the school tax, the Avalorum tax, and uh, to say I've received pushback would be an understatement. Uh, and the, the the main source of my inks was a place called Alpha Insurance Company. And in fact, uh, I, I would just go ahead and, and say that uh, on the Saturday, the bill uh, was being uh, moved through the Senate. Uh, uh, the chairman and CEO of Alpha called the president of the Senate and with, with a simple instruction to kill that bill. Now, if I heard you correctly, did you say that 80% of the property that is agricultural is not even included in the in Avalorum tax of being levied for that property, for those properties? Under, it, I said approximately 75 or 80% of the geography of Alabama is either farmland or forest land. And that is not included as a part of the... It, it is included, but under, there is a current use standard that applies only under the constitutional amendments of 1978, applies only to farm and timberland. Mm. And the current use doctrine is driven by a formula that essentially reduces the accessible value of farm and timberland to the point where, in the example that Judge Smith put in his opinion, for a property that was 1,900, close to 2,000 acres of farm and timberland, paid $650 a year in property tax. That's, that's using the 6.5 mills that the state can levy. In other words, for nearly 2,000 acres, the landowner was paying $100 per mill. Wow. Now that's that's the case throughout the Black Belt, including Montgomery. Montgomery County is in the Black Belt, mm -hmm. and Montgomery County is is one of the was one of the leaders in making sure that the current use policy used the formula that takes those those properties basically that basically reduces the accessible value to close to zero. And uh, one, of the, one of the big landowners who drove that was none other than Morris Deans. So you can go back and track that one. But, you know. Okay, <laughs> that, that has been an in interesting exchange. I wanna shift our conversation just a bit and, and we'll, um, we'll talk to Nancy Eckberg of the Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform. And we want you to talk, I know you're particularly interested in uh, Am Amendment 4. So can you discuss for us Amendment 4? It's on this November's, um, this November 2020 ballot. Um, just, 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 just talk about that amendment for us, please. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, everybody. Good hearing from everybody. I loved uh, Professor English to hear your story of Alabama's history. It is should be written and required by all students to, to see it. But at any rate, uh, as everybody knows, this constitution written in 1901 was written by uh, 55 men who decided uh, that they should have white supremacy. In fact, John Knox, who was a president of the um, <clears throat> convention said, if we shall have white supremacy, we shall do it by law. And that's what they set out to do. Mm -hmm. And all the things that we have heard so far just validate that. They were also extremely clever in what they did because they said, the only way you can change this document is by a citizen's convention or article by article. Mm -hmm. And so as we have heard others say, for many years, we have tried to bring a change in fact, <clears throat> um, many of our uh, governors have seen as they've tried to govern this state how difficult it was to deal with the Constitution. And there are many who try have tried to change it. <clears throat> uh, one of the governors who actually was governor in 2014 and was a signer of the Constitutional um, Convention tried to get the change and did not. Big John Folsom tried to change it. Every many governors have all along the way. So, uh, and as was mentioned before, several of us in Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform. This is an organization, nonpartisan, uh, which was begun in uh, the year 2000 by Bailey Thompson, who was a reporter for the Birmingham News and taught uh, journalism at the University of Alabama. He was uh, an instigator and a big mover in trying to get some reform, following up on many who had been trying to get reform throughout the years. Uh, so that actually started a group of people met together in Tuscaloosa and formed this organization. We have now been trying very hard to get uh, changes. For many years, we tried just to get reform, as it's called, Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform. And then we started to change our direction and, less, and tried to get a constitutional convention, which meant, and I know that uh, Representative uh, Hatcher will be very familiar with this, we would have to have gone to the legislators to get their approval. We would have to have gotten then the voters to approve it. And then if that happened, then we would have to elect delegates who would then write a new constitution and the constitution they would write then would be brought back to the legislators to approve. and then and to the voters to approve. A long, laborious step. And the legislators, I know that uh, Representative Hatch is not one of them, but many of them didn't trust the people to write a new constitution because it meant that there could be things put in there that they didn't approve of. So it, we, we tried very hard. It never did pass. Um, and then I think it was mentioned earlier that in 2004, uh, Representative Buskey from uh, Mobile um, got an amendment passed by the House and the Senate, and it went to the voters, but it failed by just a, a very small amount. I think people weren't aware of what it had constituted, and I think that's why it failed. Then in 2012, uh, Senator Orr sponsored a constitutional amendment, and the original constitutional amendment would have been great, because all it did was remove the constitutional language that said black and white children cannot go to school together. But he was convinced by some lawyers that he, he had taken out some words uh, that they should not, they did not approve of him taking them out and they should put them back in. And those are the words that basically said they were from um, Amendment 111, which was passed after Brown versus Board of Education as a means of protest. And those words said, but nothing in this shall guarantee a right to an education. So naturally, AEA and many other organizations rallied against it because they should have. It really was a mistake for those words to be added back into the constitutional amendment. At any rate, as you well know, that failed miserably, two to one. Um, and um, so Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Forum was formed, and we have had several leaders of this community on our board, including Dr. Quartz uh, uh, and Bailey Thompson, who was the founder, Governor Brewer, uh, Sid McAnally, uh, Representative Jack Edwards, um, uh, Odessa Wolfork and uh, Scott Douglas and many others, and they uh, have worked very hard to 
get this organization working. We have tried several means of getting something passed and uh, have not been successful in getting much done. Uh, as I believe it was, uh, Jim Blackshire said, um, you know, uh, the racist, the racist concept of that constitutional convention is still there. This Amendment 4 will remove some words, but it's not going to remove the racist reasons for that document having been written. And um, so anyway, um, so those of us who are part of uh, Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform, we have lobbied. Um, I do lobby, and that's how I've met uh, Representative Hatcher in the House. Um, and we have uh, gathered signatures of 20, 70,000 citizens to say that they would urge their legislators to pass a citizens convention. But of course, we do not have initiative in this state like California and some other states do. So we cannot force the issue by an initiative. We can only offer them recommendations. And of course, they did not adhe adhere to the recommendations. Um, uh, so in 2011, the Speaker of the House and the uh, pro tem of the Senate and the governor at that time did recommend and established a constitutional revision commission. It was chaired by Governor Brewer and it was successful in passing four different good constitutional amendments. One of them, and I know we've talked about home rule, which is an onerous reason why we've got 947 constitutional amendments because the local citizens can't do what they need to do because citizens because constitutional amendments have been passed to spray for mosquitoes or pick up dead animals or uh, allow a, a constable name to be changed to a uh, sheriff and that sort of silly stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, we all worked very hard to get something done. Um, but though, but one of the constitutional amendments did offer at least modified limited home rule. It isn't going to give the counties everything they need, but it gives them some of the powers that municipalities have. Um, counties have always been considered part of the state, and so that's why the, the legislators have been unwilling to just let go and let them have their own power. Uh, but the constitutional amendment that allowed limited home rule did not allow uh, taxing increases or even additional new taxes, and it does not allow um, land uh, De determination of what what the land can be considered and so um, but as we have talked about before um, part of the Constitution that is so onerous is of course the way in which taxes are assessed and that's what Jim uh, Blackshire brought up and uh, you probably all know which is kind of unbelievable but that up until five years ago Alabamians earning four thousand six hundred dollars a year were taxed for their income. Uh, and the threshold was raised in, uh, in, in two year, a couple years ago to $12,600. But still, that level of uh, uh, taxation is um, very difficult for the poorest among us. In fact, as you well know, many of those who are the poorest among us pay a very a large share of their uh, income towards um, taxes, whereas the very richest among us pay maybe say 2% as opposed to maybe say 20 to 25%. Um, and uh, all, all, many aspects of, of uh, the taxing in the Constitution would have to change. But as uh, I believe it was um, Professor English pointed out, and maybe, uh, maybe no, when may, it was Representative Hatcher. When you're dealing with people who own land in this state, when you are dealing with the agriculture and with the those who are part of the timber industry, you have a huge um, wall in front of you. And uh, I lived in Michigan at one time, and I know Weyerhaeuser, who operates there, they pay five times to seven times more taxes on the property that they use for collecting timber than they do in Alabama. In fact, I know that the numbers show that if we would um, increase, that our um, taxation on land is lower than our sisters, Mississippi, Tennessee, um, uh, and all of our surrounding states, we are the lowest in the South. We are the lowest in the nation. And so, 
we have a what they call a three-pronged stool, three-legged stool. We have um, a situation where the majority of taxes come from sales tax. Mm -hmm. Now, I am grateful that we are finally taxing internet sales. I think that's something that has needed to happen. Thanks heaven it has. So, all right, now let me get to Amendment 4. I've, I digress. I've talked about everything else about that. So we have decided in Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform that although we tried many efforts, we even had a, a mock constitutional convention. We brought people from throughout the state as delegates, wrote a new constitution, but of course it had no teeth because it, it was not legally uh, uh, a constitutional amendment. But so we have decided that this year we will try a, a recompilation. The recompilation is authorized by the legislature to give to the legislative services to recompile the constitution and remove all the racist language, uh, the language that says, that talks about poll tax, the language that talks about black and white children going to school together, and the language that says no white person can marry a black uh, person or a, a, even a offspring of that black person. Those kinds of racist issues would be removed. In addition to that, there's a lot of duplication. Um, in uh, the um, legislative article, section 93, it says, the state shall not lend its good name or its money or power to any private enterprise. Well, they had to build bridges, they had to build roads, they had to build docks, they had to build airports, so they had to call, uh, we had to have constitutional amendments to allow them to do those things. So basically, those constitutional amendments that allowed the state to do business with private companies make moot the uh, uh, article um, that the section set 93 of the uh, uh, executive uh, of the legislative article. And so this will, um, as I said before, this will end up allowing the legislative services to recompile the constitution to get rid of the redundancy and duplication and words that are no longer legal, compile it into a um, more readable, you know, you almost have to have a law degree and then some to be able to read and understand. A, a, an ordinary he, a citizen of Alabama cannot pick up the constitution and read because it is not necessarily the truth. Mm -hmm. This might be amended by 700 other amendments. So it's a case of making things concise and understandable so the average Alabamian can understand what they're reading. And then whatever the legislative services do, we will come back to Representative Hatcher and others in the House and Senate, get their approval on it, and then it will go on the website of uh, of uh, um, Merrill's website for the uh, Secretary of State's website so everybody can read it and see what has been done and then the voters have to prove it again. So this is the first step to eliminate lacist words, as I say, not concept. It's not going to get rid of the concept that created that document in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that, um, that overview and that conversation. I, I, I would like to, to pose a question, and I, I would like everybody on the panel to, to sort of address this. What, what, what would be your, if, if given an opportunity to sit at a, a constitutional convention, an Alabama constitutional convention, what would be your primary um, change or primary um, article that you would like to see incorporated into that constitution? <laughs> Go on, uh, I would say you should take taxing out of the Constitution. Taxing structure has no business being in the Constitution. Right. Yeah. And I would say you should give a right to an education uh, uh, and, and that definitely and, there, and many other rights. I know there are other rights that are not allowed. You know, um, Hatcher, you, you seem to agree with that. Um, 100%. 100%. 100%. And I'm, and I'm, I'm going to be the first politician to not have any other words that I can offer to that. Uh, that, that is it. <laughs> what, what do you think, uh, Dr. English and Attorney Blackshear? Yeah, I'm tending in with the, with the, with the same um, ideas as my fellow panel, uh, panelists. However, I would, I'll um, add that, or I will add that, although the concept racism never will, uh, well, let me take that back. I'm, 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 I'm being overly uh, skeptical there. The concept has yet to 
uh, being removed. You know, when W.B. Du Bois talked about the color line being the most problematic matter in the 20th century. Well, we still know now, despite some individuals talking about colorblind societies, that the color line is still very thick, particularly in the form of Confederate states. So though the concept will not be removed from some but such racist language, I do still think that it's important symbolically that that language be removed. If nothing further than this idea of colored, you know, we know we have this 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 sort of nomenclature now that says, well, people of color, which all typically tells me what the H-E-L two of the letters there means by people of color, I still don't have any idea. But removing that type language still shows that there perhaps is a now a finally a concerted effort to try to um, understand Black persons and other social minorities as human beings, as opposed to simply subjects that can be manipulated at, at, the, at, the, at the will of certain very powerful business and political and uh, social figures. Uh-huh. Attorney Blackfield. Yeah, well, two things. Uh, I would add to what uh, Nancy just named, uh, the home rule power should be affirmatively provided counties in a, a new constitution. But it, it, it's a, it, you can't look at just one section. Well, what you have to understand is I, instead of calling a, a concept of, of racial discrimination or a concept of rights, I call it the uh. architecture. Wow. of white supremacy. Wow. I, when I talk to people, I say what we have in the Alabama Constitution is the architecture of white supremacy. And in that architecture, you can fit whatever the controlling political power in the state wants in order to preserve it. And let me just give you one example that's going before us right now. Yes. Amendment one. Yes. Vote yes. no. Yes, yes, yes. Amendment yes. one yes. changes that language I just read to you that's in section 177A. That's right. that's right. It changes from every citizen of the United States has the right to vote to only citizens right. of the United States have the right to vote. Yeah. Obviously aimed at our Latino citizen, at our that's Latino right. colleagues. And by the way, Representative Hatcher, that has the effect of taking away from the legislature the yes. plenary power to grant the right to vote to people who are not citizens. That's right. For example, the 191 Constitution contained a provision that authorized that 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 gave the right to vote to to every male, every white male of foreign birth who had indicated his intention Intent. to become right. a citizen. And the same provision was in the 1875 Constitution. Okay, so what, we're, what we've got here, what we've got here is a, a step backwards. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's, and and it's, it's an, a racially motivated step backwards. Uh -huh. But nobody, you know, it, it doesn't raise the kind of red flag that gets attention and that's just too bad. Uh -huh. Vote no on Amendment One, please. Yeah, yeah. and as there was an attorney that you, know, you know, I think one of the things that you know we was trying to, we, I was trying to get across in that committee, uh, is about the judges, right? And and the, the idea that, uh, as I s stressed to my colleague who brought uh, that particular legislation, I said, look, in the state of Alabama, as far as I know, we elect judges, we don't appoint them, and this whole process of trying to uh, extend out the time that an individual who might be serving in the capacity of a person who has retired or resigned or may have passed away, that somehow or the other, we're going to add an additional two years to that time, creating nothing short of incumbency. And my thinking, my thinking was, well, look, if these, and, there, and, and the argument was, if these individuals are willing to take their time and, and, and serve out an appointment, then we should make it worth their time. Well, my thinking is, well, let them run for the office. Let them run for the judgeship. But uh, we're having all these kinds of things that are happening. And unfortunately, when you're in a super minority, uh, you're simply, uh, in my view, a consultant sitting in the chamber. And that's about it, because mm -hmm. they don't even need us for the, uh, in order to pass these things. We, with the time we have left, I just like each one of our um, guests to to just give some parting thoughts about um, 
what you see in terms of the future of um, constitutional reform, what you see, what you'd like to see. And if you could, we, let's start. Let's start with um, uh, Attorney uh, Blackshear. Yeah, I think that in the year 2020, uh, we are coming to realize as a country that there is a movement afoot to install white supremacy in the Constitution of the United States through the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. And my, my message is for the going forward, we're going to have to somehow, even in red states like Alabama, make judges and elected officials in the legislature and the executive branch accountable, accountable to all the people under the threat of not being able to get reelected. Uh -huh. uh, and we have been, we're, we're not used to doing that in Alabama because we're used to calling in the feds. Uh -huh. There hasn't been much done. All of the changes that we've been talking about in the Alabama constitution have been brought about by federal court order. And uh, we're going to have to get out of that mandate because the federal judiciary is turning away from us. And it's going to be another generation, in my opinion, before the federal judiciary is ready to come back and enforce the 14th, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments uh, to the Constitution. Uh, we, it is, as hopeless as it may seem, our, we have a better chance and at least we have, we don't have our hands tied to go forward with an agenda that that calls on the Alabama Supreme Court to enforce the right to vote, for example, to make it real and effective and not allow the legislature to adopt rules that suppress the vote or that make it more difficult to vote. Why hasn't, why hasn't the legislature, for example, provided 14 days of early voting like they have in Louisiana, in Texas, and other southern states? They, the answer is simple, because they don't want those people to vote. Uh, and we have to make, we have to find a way to make our state elected officials, including the elected judiciary, accountable to the people, to all the people. Uh, and that's, that, that's, a political, that's a political skill. It's a political process that we're not familiar with. We have not, with that we've never used in this state in my lifetime. Um, Nancy Eckberg. Yes. What would you, just, just, just shortly and, and brief, what would you like to see in, um, in in the next in the near future, the near and distant future, and uh, and what do you actually see? You know, what do you what do you think is reality as opposed to what you would you would envision or what would like to see? Well, of course, I'd like to see a constitutional convention and rewrite that whole document. But in lieu of that, um, I would like to get rid of Amendment 111, which is amendment attached to several articles uh, following the judgment, Brown versus the Board of Education, that tried to restrict any um, activist judge from uh, requiring the right to education or other things on the basis of um, the amendment. And so those kinds of, that amendment 111 needs to be removed from the whole document. Um, I would like to see us to, uh, step into the thorny um, arena of trying to get taxes taken out of the Constitution. Uh, I think that's maybe too big a bite to take, but it's wrong that we should be taxing people at $12,000 a year and at the same rate as those who are earning $50 million a year. And so that's, uh, that's an aberration. Uh, we should be able to have um, the, uh, uh, what is called the, uh, um, 
the the uh, what Jim? What did you call it? Uh, the the content the use the way in which we tax um, ad valorem taxes on no the way. basis of, of the value of the land, whereas those pieces of property could probably sell for five or seven times their value if they were sold on the market and to developers to build new homes. But to be able to keep that at, as um, uh, as constant use or as a special use means that they are taxed at such a low rate that it's just not appropriate. And, and that is, that's why our, um, we have, as everybody knows, we have uh, two, two um, we have an education funded um, budget and then we have the general budget. The general budget is always hurting because it takes its money from the um, special use or from the um, ad valorem taxes. So I would like to see that change. And then we, we, we want to go to um, uh, Burgess English next. And what are we going to do next? Oh, no, oh, you're no, talking no. about yeah. Burgess English. If you wanted to chime in, did you? Sure. Well, again, uh, my fellow panelists have gone down some some areas in terms of constitutionalism that I would like to to see, particularly with regard to home rule. You know, there are you know, mosquitoes and golf carts and so forth that have no place being determined by state legislators in Montgomery. Um, I, I take a in terms of what's practical. Um, unfortunately, because of the demographic makeup of the state, I'm not certain that many of the things that we on this particular participating on this virtual day has seemed to uh, want to happen. I'm not certain that they shall happen, but that doesn't mean that we should not con continue. But away from what can be done regarding the Constitution per, per se, I think what's going to be ultra important, uh, Howard, is that we in academic education in particular get the individual to understand the importance not only of what's going on right now, but the importance of the um, history that is of the Constitution. How did these very racist white supremacist and cognate developments come into being and then get individuals, particularly you, to understand that it hasn't gone anywhere. The day has changed, the month has changed, the year has changed, but that very almost visceral seeming hatred um, and disgust and dislike and so many other actions we, we, we can use for universal equality in this state still exists. So what does that then entail? It, to me, entails having bona fide civic education for Alabama students and looking at um, Alabama's history, its constitutional history, and also its ethnic and its racial history, emphasizing what strides have been made, but also not shying away from right. those problems that still exist right now. The one big issue that I still see is that individuals are, unlike us today on participating in this uh, event, we are still afraid to call us um, Congresswoman Sewell once said, we are afraid to call a spade a spade. And there's no ethnic or racial bias to that. And that is the color line still is uh, still exists right now and it's still thick. And it covers just about every major issue or problem, outright problem that Alabamians face to this very day, from education to property taxes to you can go on and on. But that's the root cause. With the, with the seconds we have left, um, I, I want to uh, turn to Kirk Hatcher, please. Representative I, I am grateful to you, uh, Dr. Robinson, you and your staff for the grace you extended to me uh, in being a part of this and certainly I'll be able to reach out uh, and talk on yesterday and make sure I'm here today. Thank you. I'm grateful to this panel. I'm especially grateful to Attorney Blackshear, whose name I haven't heard in quite some time when I worked with Saul, as I said earlier, Saul C. Uh, uh, we, we had occasion to see him often and I'm grateful that he's still out here on the battlefield. Uh, look, look, I am, the one thing that, that rings true to me is that we have entered into, uh, firmly into the convergence of two pandemics, obviously one viral and one racial. And what may happen as it relates to that, that racial piece in particular, is that it may give way to the possibility of things that are unimaginable in terms of the changes that we might see. And my hope is in these young people, uh, millennials and Generation Z who have decided that they're going to have the full complement of their citizenship and not only for themselves, but for any and all other uh, ethnic minorities in this country. And they are even willing, if necessary, to die for it. Now, that level of conviction gives me hope that they're going to see to it 
that change occurs. That is the hope that I take forth with me and whatever I'm doing to try to do our best to serve our people and to do right by the people. Because as my mom says, you just be right. And a part of what we witness and the strong language, it will not leave me, is what Jim Blackshear said about how this racist language and white supremacy is codified in that 1901 constitution. Our young people need to know that and they need to be in a position to be empowered to respond to it. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panel. Um, Attorney Blackshear, um, Representative Kirk Hatcher, Nancy Eckberg, and of course, Dr. English. Um, we're going to have a few closing remarks from Dr. Janice Franklin, Dean of the Library of the Levi Watkins Learning Center and Project Director for the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University. Thank you so much. May I take this opportunity to thank all of you in our audience for your attendance today. We also want to thank all of our program participants and members of our administration for their support of our mission in the National Center as we seek to preserve, reach, study, and teach the history and culture of African Americans. There are many people who have helped to make this program possible, and we want to express our sincere appreciation to the students, staff, faculty, and technicians across our campus who have assisted us in the production of this virtual public program. We also appreciate the support of our alumni, patrons of the National Center, and our local and global community who have assisted the work and the growth of our center. We welcome your continued support. Again, thank you, and we invite you to attend future programs from the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University, the university at the heart of the modern civil rights movement. Thank you. <laughs>